So I'm really, really happy to be here, welcoming you to the spring series of Wednesday at NICO. Uh, the weather cooperated. We have the most beautiful day of the year so far, right here, right now. Thank you, Jim, for bringing it up. Anytime. Um, I'm supposed to say some useful stuff. So. Uh, Jim is the Roth H. and Sam Mad 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 Madrid Professor of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering at Lehigh University, and he manages the Laboratory for Particle Mixing, mixing and Self-Organization. Okay, so my duty is done, and now I'm going to share the really cool stuff, which is that Jim was a student here at Northwestern, and he was a student of Julio. So if you want to hear good stories about Julio, you should ask him, but then he will have to kill you. <laughs> they waited all these years for the chance to say this. <laughs> anyway, I mean, it's really a pleasure to have Jim back here. He does really exciting research and he's a very entertaining speaker. So we are all in for a treat and um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I was, how many people here are graduate students? Uh, quite a few. There's free food, so I figure at least more than one. Um, and I like the free food still. My, I'm driven with my graduate student lunch uh, stomach still. So um, yeah, I was in your seat at one point. And did I have interest in going to academia? Uh, I didn't know if that was the case, but some of you might, some of you not you know, know yet. But um, I was in a lab in an atmosphere that was more than chemical engineering. It was very diverse. Uh, I took a class on creative, uh, you know, creativity and how to manage the creative process. That doesn't happen in engineering classes, schools, especially back in the 90s. So I think Julio was kind of foreseeing things that you're maybe more accustomed to now that certainly didn't exist when I was a graduate student. And I felt very fortunate to be ahead of the cusp there. Besides the fact, the inspiration of you know, great research before me and then our ability to add to that. So um, I know it's a bit of a diverse uh, group of students. So I've given a little more intro and I'll try to keep the time, but the 10 till is when we finish. Is that? Yeah. So if I'm running late, I might skip through a couple of slides. Just give you a little uh, background. Um, I am in the Lehigh Valley, so just I'm from the Chicago area originally, but I went out east for my first academic job and I've never left. Um, within a three hour drive, you can easily be in Connecticut all the way down to DC. Things on the East Coast are closer than they are here. So if you're from the Midwest, you're really missing out a little bit, but um, I do day trips to DC and I do day trips to New York City and Philly. So, um, and there's lots of academic institutions. Lehigh University itself is about an hour and a half from New York City and an hour from Philly. Okay. Um, and the campus is on a hillside. It's absolutely beautiful. If you ever get a chance to visit, uh, it's really uh, a wonderful place to be. Somewhere between Hogwarts all the way to the new building I'm in, which is all glass walls. And the joke is I don't have a window in my office, but all the graduate students have windows. So that's how we prioritize things. So if you think about being a faculty member there, maybe that doesn't sway you there. But um, let's see, make sure. I don't know if that needs to click right. There we go. Um, so in any case, uh, do stop by and join us sometime if you're in the area. So, um, and I'm also committed to giving a diversity statement at every talk I give. I mean, number one, my own group, if you don't believe in DEI as an important con con you know, contribution to the field you're in and the people you're around, you shouldn't join my group, but let alone Lehigh is a kind of place where you can express yourself freely and it's very inclusive. Um, my website actually has more information than this uh, on it if you wanted to learn about our specifically, but my students also get training in this area. And it when I say inclusive, all, all the way across, you know, whether your background was uh, from another country or the military or whatever. So it could be truly inclusive, but um, in any case, I have a commitment to at least mention that every time we give a public talk in this uh, way. So, um, and if you'd like to learn more about what I know about this, I'd be happy to reach out to me sometime. Our lab is gilchristlab.info. And so uh, I also have to thank the people who do the work first, because sometimes you run out of time. I certainly often do. Um, and so this is my current group. It's a little bit of a lie because 
uh, the two postdocs here are now back in England in their first academic positions where they are lecturers and doing independent research. Um, and uh, a lot of the research you'll see today are from the people highlighted in red, and it seems like a lot, but I'm trying to give as much credit as possible because there have been things that were developed years before the things we're thinking about now that weren't possible without those innovations, without the way we were approaching those problems then and the way we approach the problems now. Um, so most of the work I'm gonna talk about is really Dr. Sam Wilson Whitford. Uh, he's at the University of Leicester right now. Um, uh, Jingwei Gao has made every particle that you'll see uh, that we talked about today. And then we have some really creative undergrads who just can't keep them out of the lab, to be honest. It's, it's outstanding. So and I've had lots of different uh, past students and collaborators. Um, and of course, funding, I shouldn't forget to mention that. APL is the Applied Physics Labs at Johns Hopkins uh, University. And I was a, most of this is funded by a subcontract through their defense-like things. So none of that information will actually be in this doc. But um, so my own research is the laboratory for particle mixing and self organization. The joke is that if you're not mixing, you're ordering. And so you're doing a little bit of everything in there. But it all falls under this broad category of engineered particle research, which sounds very engineering, but I'm going to switch it over to maybe more on the complex system side eventually here. Um, and so I've got a link scale here from nanoparticles up to boulders. And uh, there are some things that are similar, like steric interactions and confinement and density. And there are times when, uh, of course, the interactions of nanoparticles are very different than what happens in an avalanche, right? Um, and so, but, but discrete things in other fluids is complicated. And we'll get more into that. Uh, just to give you an overview of our expertise, um, we do some particle synthesis. We make a lot of Janus particles. I'll talk a little bit about that in this talk. But uh, the rest of it's pretty much recipe driven. So it's easy to make your own particles if you are interested. Particle assembly is really where the science happens. What are the interactions? What are the collective behavior of particles? Um, you know, how do we see patterns? How can we mimic other natural processes in simpler systems is often a theme in, uh, you know, and, you know, particle research, right? So um, whether you're talking about aggregation, stabilization of particles, crystallization, field driven assembly. I have biologically mediated assembly. I don't generally work on that. So if it's in white, it's something we've kind of interfaced with, but I wouldn't say is our expertise. But we're always doing this in a sense, thinking at the larger scale, okay? Thinking how can we inform something at the micro scale that's gonna help us at the macro scale, okay? I love these kind of small Mickey Mouse experiments to learn things, but my own lab always keeps one foot somewhere close to applications, somewhere close to scale up, somewhere close to engineering applications. And I know not everyone in this room is an engineer and that may not be appropriate, but there are experiments we do where it is just how do two particles interact in a fluid, right? And then there's ones where I can't believe we were able to scale that up. And I love the interdisciplinary parts of both of those. So um, all the way from fluidization, solid handling, rheology and transport. And you'll see aspects of that in this talk. Um, just to give you a little bit of the, the past, this was me working in Julio's uh, space on granular mixing in tumblers. Um, and so I worked on granular mixing, segregation, rheology. Um, I'm going to get into the when does rheology matter and when does it not a little bit. But I mostly did simulations until Julio literally said to me, you must go in the lab and do the experiments or we'll let someone else take your project over. And I am 90% an experimentalist now, okay? So um, I, <laughs> it must, well, all experiments and simulations must be theory informed, right? So the, all of us are theoreticians, so that, that didn't go away. I did the majority of my classes actually in the math, in the applied math department at Northwestern. So um, in fact, at one point when they had their qualifier, they were worried that I was not taking it. And I said, I'm not one of your students, so. <laughs> But we worked, uh, I then did a postdoc with Jennifer Lewis at University of Illinois. She's at Harvard now looking at how particles assemble. These look like simulations, but we have high-speed microscopes that can accurately find the locations of small particles with nanoscale precision. And then we can use that data as if you did a simulation, right? And so this is really striving for simulation details from experiments is a theme in our work. Uh, we do a lot of work in uh, suspensions and microfluidic devices tracking every individual particle, getting their structure factors, and getting an idea of how do these microscopic interactions pan out into macroscopic stresses and rheology in these systems. 
So um, our current research right now is closer to coatings because there's lots of particles in microscale flows for coatings. Thinking as simple as the latex paint or a cosmetic even, or a paint that goes on your automobile. Ironically, you spend a lot of time looking at the paint job on a new car without thinking about how the engine runs, right? But um, you know, about 40% of the waste in a given auto plant would be from redoing the paint job, not making sure the engine runs correctly. So that's, uh, that, that's consumer-driven economics, right? Um, so this would be like maybe a pharmaceutical formulation that's gonna deliver drugs. And as it goes from a liquid to a solid state while it's drying, tracking the particles during the drying process. So this again, looks like a simulation, but it is actually experimental data during drying. We're watching paint dry, literally, <laughs> in our simulation, uh, in, our, in our lab. And so uh, we can also do microbiology using the particle tracers themselves to give signatures of what is the environment as it evolves during drying. And then this experiment is related to these that we use particles to track the evolution of fluids in temperature fields, which I'm really excited about. This is thermophoretic motion, but we're also launching this into outer space uh, this summer and this fall, which is, again, to get an extra two square feet of lab space, it was easier to launch stuff into space sometimes than get it in my own institution, but. Uh, that's not true. I actually have a new, I'm in a new building, beautiful lab. Uh, so that was driven, that is being driven by uh, Maria and uh, Nazrin. And so um, there's a real broad swath of types of physics and scales that you see here, right? And I don't know what I'll be working on five years from now. If I came back, it'd probably be something completely different. So the talk I'm giving today is a little bit of the past and a little bit of current and future in granular materials. Um, and so why granular? Okay, so we're going to focus on the upper end of that spectrum. So this great cartoon, if you haven't seen it in the New York Times, uh, areas of physics by difficulty. Sorry if it offends anyone here, but everyone knows they're Newtonian physics. And of course, special relativity gets a little bit more difficult. And then of course, you know, quantum mechanics, general relativity, that's right where the rubber hits the road. That's what you read in Scientific American. That seems like the hardest stuff. And then sand. <laughs> And this is actually the perfect audience for sand, right? Because it's a complex system. That's really what this identifies. And, and everything that you study can be represented by a pile of sand in some very broad esoteric way, right? And so um, very specifically, you know, sand, I can sp speak, I do work with sand, right? So it is as simple as sand sometimes, you know? Uh, you add a little bit of water and sand behaves like this, right? You build sand castles. In fact, the tallest sandcastle ever built was underwater using hydrophobic sand, right? So you can, you can think of surface treatments and size and polydispersity of these things. So there's a lot of physics involved there, but sometimes just the network of interactions is more important than the actual um, you know, physics of what's happening at the surface of the particles. Um, sand dunes, interactions with fluids is the easiest way to summarize sand dunes. This is sand dunes on another planet. So it is you know, broadly applicable, these physics and how you scale them. Um, and then, of course, if you aerate enough into that, you get things like sandstorms. So sand, okay, particle physics. But I'm an engineer, so we also think a lot about, you know, other valuable stuff. Now, food, you think of as low value, but when we run out of it, it's much higher value, trust me. Um, and not just handfuls. This is what it looks like before it comes to you know, the corn syrup that's in your drink right now, right? Um, and this is what happens when you don't treat it, when you treat it like a fluid rather than a solid mass, because the stresses inside are not the same as the way a fluid and rho GH works uh, in a column, okay? So you have to engineer differently around particle materials. And then, of course, you can make your own particles and foodstuffs, and it's amazing that there are billions and billions and trillions of M&Ms out there made, and you expect every package to open up and it be the same. M&Ms are a good example of that. Pharmaceutical materials are even more important. Every you just take it for granted. I mean, I take a pill, and it's not going to have more ingredient or less ingredient. In fact, I'm stealing this line from Julio. In fact, he he said this the first time I heard it. If the pill had ten times the active ingredient in it, what would you expect to happen to your body, right? Yeah. You know? And billions of pills are made every year for every pharmaceutical you can think of. These are cosmetics. Just think about really low value things that go into really high value products in the end. That's probably the largest markup, even more than pharmaceuticals. Um, and then energy, of course, is driven by particle-based things. In fact, if you think about cement, this is, uh, even though that's coal behind here, you talk about the amount of energy cement takes. Uh, we make 15 cubic kilometers of cement per year on earth, 
a cubic kilometer is insane, okay? You walk 15, you know, uh, you know, 15 cubic kilometers. You walk X amount of kilometers that way and another way and then into the air, fill it with cement every year, mostly China right now. But every ton produced has 900 kilograms of CO2, okay? So that is actually what's coming from the back of there. And so that's all granular process. And of course, there's granular processes that you could say are happening within your body right now. And in fact, I love looking at the literature. You search granular, the uh, um, synthetic biologists and people who work on like wound healing. So granular is the most popular term of making granular hydrogels that allow just the right porosity for transport to happen. So I'm glad they're finally catching up. Um, so um, why, why is it interested from a complex system standpoint? I'll give you some examples. These are photoelastic disks that were developed by Bob Berenger and his group. Uh, Karen Daniels is the author, uh, co-author on the article that ran that. Worked closely with him, so she's continued that research. Um, these photoelastic disks show stress, and it's great because if you put these particles in a pile, you can see sometimes the interactions are isotropic, relatively speaking, but then you just shift the weight on them a little bit, and they become very anisotropic, right? And the stress profile changes dramatically with a very small amount of deformation in the material, okay? Um, here's a pile of sand, let's say, and you can see, in fact, the highest point of the pile is the least, not the highest point of weight underneath. The stress distribution is completely different. And uh, this is going through a hopper, same thing, this hopper jammed up, and all of the stress of those chain of particles at the bottom is sustaining all the weight, or some fraction of the weight of the particles above it, right? And so even if you just move this sphere one particle diameter down, you can see the evolution of, of stress chains in these systems. So those of you who work on network theory, I mean, you, you've seen this, right? But you don't see it often. And that's the whole point, that they're, they're often hidden to the eye, right? Um, it's great in these experiments that you can see those. So I love this picture because this is a series of roots and the plants sense the stresses in granular material and then change their behavior, right? So. Uh, that's another way to think about probing materials, right? Uh, nature does it automatically. So um, it was mentioned I was here a long time ago. I, my kids say I look a lot different. Uh, and literally sitting at the bottom in tech, uh, taking that image. And I worked on granular drums, okay? Um, and we're gonna go through this relatively quickly because I wanna give you some background for the cool things we're doing now, but this is still inspiration to this day of the things I do. If you think about rotating a drum that's partially filled, only a small amount of material is flowing. In fact, you can get into different regimes where it's either partially flowing and then stopping, so you have intermittency in its flow, or continuous flow, or you can actually start throwing particles into the air, or if you rotate fast enough, obviously it's centrifuging and nothing really happens. That's interesting. And so uh, you can characterize that by how fast you rotate, of course. And if you're in this regime, I'm gonna show you two videos. This is the same video. This one's running forward and this one's running backward and turned on its side. And honestly, if I didn't have something else in there, you probably couldn't tell me the difference, okay? So I'm not saying it's reversible. There's also diffusive motion of the grains in here, but these uh, ended up with this Lehigh University pattern and these started with that and now have mixed materials. And ironically, you say you know, mixed materials, but if I have particles, in a system and they flow, they segregate. The larger, less dense particles are making it to the edge of that flow. All the raisins go to the bottom of your raisin bran, right? Everyone's had this experience. The small change goes to the bottom of your pocket or your purse, right? Um, and so as soon as you have two different sizes of particles, they segregate. So this is different than fluids. And like I said, it's a pretty broad audience. So I include a couple of slides just talking about fluids and mixing in case, how do fluids mix? So some of you might have coffee here, and you're used to mixing your coffee, you throw it in there, you don't worry about it too much, but these are instability-driven mixing, right? Mixing there, what you're missing is all these small interactions when you deform the fluid and allow it to stretch and fold over itself. And these are the kinds of things that inspired me when I was a student, still inspire me today. And you can see here that these two dye blobs, one mixed incredibly efficient and the other one just hung out. And that's because of the underlying kinematics of the flow, right? And so this exists in any sort of flow, if you really think about it. And again, visualizing it is important. Um, ironically, in your coffee, when you make these cool patterns, your barista makes these cool patterns and they remain there, the reason they remain there is because it's a foam, or in other words, a granular-like material at the top of your coffee. So this is happening underneath, and that is the particle-based physics that's happening at the top, right? 
And also there's instabilities that help mixing. So I push a lower viscosity fluid into a higher viscosity fluid. You have instabilities that will help make the, you know, increase the interfacial area and mixing essentially in these systems as well. These are, these are miscible fluids actually that, that are being pumped. It might be admissible in this video, but you can do it either way actually. Um, so there are great instabilities that you can visualize that work in fluids, but we don't know if they work for granular materials, for instance. So Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities, these are two different density fluids. And if you wait just long enough, it's flowing down and then recirculating up. And you have enough shear that you start getting waves. If you think that looks familiar, you may have seen it up in the sky, okay? And so Kelvin Helmholtz, these are hidden actually amongst us all the time. Sometimes they're visualized by the clouds, right? And so good experiments allow you to visualize this uh, extremely well. Um, and then those of you who have not studied fluid mechanics, this is a classic video. And even if you have put two different dyes in and mix them, but if you do it at a low Reynolds number inertialist frame, then if you undo the boundary conditions, essentially rotate backwards, it unmixes, okay? That's not magic. That was not a reversed video, okay? So we don't have equations and understanding of granular materials like we have of fluids, okay? Much more complicated right, in some ways. So my thesis was working on granular mixers like this and drums, but the key was how can we increase mixing? So instead of thinking about everything segregates to the center, can we have some periodic modulation to the flow by changing the geometry? And then you start seeing other pattern formation, but it's still, is driven by the underlying kinematics of the flow. And the, the beauty of this is that you think of the particles as two different phases, the small and the large particles that were originally sort of mixed and then they segregated. But unlike fluids, they, if you think of like oil and water, there's surface energy that also derives stresses in those systems. Whereas granular materials, okay, we can get into a deeper argument of whether two different sized particles, you know, when they segregate, whether there's an interfacial energy. If there is, it's really small, okay? Let's just leave it at that. Um, there's no reason for the particles to be attracted to each other. There are reasons for the flux to be a similar like term that can be interpreted as like a surface energy. Again, incredibly small compared to most fluid systems. Um, and so really thinking about, you know, how can mixing occur through breaking symmetry in these systems? Uh, it was early work, but what's interesting also is that that came down, that striping pattern came down to the fact that the rheology or how it flows while it's in that flowing layer was subtly different and caused the pattern formation to change. When I was a graduate student, we never talked about rheology in the lab, almost never, okay? And rheology is thinking about how you apply stress was the deformation of the fluid, okay? For those of you who are not familiar, hair gel is very different than honey, okay? It actually can sustain its own weight, for instance. So um, when we were actually even back in this time, we were looking at crazy geometries so much that we called this the granular lava lamp. The pattern would never come back to where it started because of the periodicity and the way things were segregating. So this is the kind of fun we were having when I was in the lab. Um, and then Julio is gonna come back and say, but you never published that. So that was the... Since then, things have got, the world has opened up completely, okay? Back then, just the idea of studying granular systems was ama amazing and now, you know, active matter. So there's, these are bacteria near a wall. And you see that when they swim, they preferentially swim along the wall. And that has something to do with their hydrogenic interactions and how they swim. Very complicated, but you can boil it down to a simple set of rules also, similar to like that in granular systems. This is obviously dilute, but when you have a lot of these particles together, they behave differently, right? And what's even better than that, we can start engineering systems you know, uh, so, okay, so here's sprockets. This is uh, the Grzybowski group that was here at Northwestern made these sprockets. And this is active matter around it, just randomly, random fluctuations that eventually do work in the system, okay? So you can take that energy from that system and have it do work. In fact, there are great experiments where if you put these bugs and so forth in a rheometer and you start flowing it, you align them, and then you stop pushing it and they will keep swimming in that direction it actually has a negative viscosity. The energy generated by the bugs in there continue to add stress to the system, okay? Um, and what's great is we can engineer systems now where we have, these are particles that are brownie in motion, but when the light goes on, there's a chemical reaction and then you'll start seeing them swim along, right? I didn't give a proper credit. This is so easy to do. We do it in our lab all the time. Um, and these particles will take like kind of a, a directed motion then have a random turn and so it's a run and tumble thing, almost like sperm swim, you know, in, in natural processes, okay? 
And so thinking about the physics of these, and these were these are dilute, these are dilute. This was dense enough that you could extract enough work from them, right? But we'll go into why density matters in these systems in a little bit. So what if we make sand, the granular stuff, into miniature robots? People have done this. The Driscoll Lab is doing things like this. If you don't know her research, I'll show some of it, but you should be paying more attention then. Doing awesome things. But uh, this is also uh, Pecha uh, Blastos. I have a hard time with her last name. Lahoska, right? Lahoska, got it. Uh, and it, a mistake is always the V, right? So um, she looks at modeling systems where you have particles and you have a charge, and then there's a bifurcation, a hot bifurcation that essentially causes the charge instability such that it will start rolling in a random direction. And that video there, if I replay it, uh, hopefully you can see that it's on and it's off and it's on and it's off and it takes a random direction every time it's rolling. And that's interesting. There's a lot of cool things to study in itself. And I think back in the 90s, that's all we would have studied maybe. But what we study now is the collective dynamics, right? How these interact with each other and almost phase behavior dynamics. Like how does this look like matter that are, that's atomic and how it behaves in different phases, right? So physicists certainly love working in this space of you know, when you get rolling clusters, disordered things, and then swarms. And the swarms itself, it looks disordered, but there's structure there, right? There's correlation link scales that are just longer in time and scale than what you're seeing in the cluster, right? So awesome physics, the collective behavior. So these are self-activated -active, activated materials. You, you can have responsive materials that behave this way. So these are micro rollers. You can think of like either um, the Driscoll group used to make these um, little cubes that would rotate. I make Janus particles, we'll talk about that in a second. Another guy uh, in Germany makes them flow uphill, a single one flow through blood vessels. And I saw that research after I was doing the research I was doing, and I was thinking, they totally missed the boat. Why use a single micro roller in any system, right? The interesting part is when you have lots of them collectively interacting. And so if you blur your eyes, you can't tell whether this is a fluid instability or another instability, right? And you can scale things similarly. I'm not gonna get into the details. This is also just goals work when she was a postdoc. And you can just make these particles rotate and you can get things that behave like these self, uh, you know, self-driven systems, right? Self-activated systems. So all we're doing in this case, in this case, in this case, we're rotating a magnetic field that drives kind of responsive motion of a single particle. I can study that to death. I can let it settle to a surface. I can let it roll. A single particle is really boring. Lubrication theory, I mean, okay, it is interesting physics, but it's the left end of the scale of complexity, not the right end, right? So the right end uh, is, is definitely why do these clusters and why do you see a wavelength spontaneously form in these systems and so forth, right? Okay. Um, so... Another cool thing is that when they break off into mini clusters, they study these as little groups of rollers that now behave differently. In fact, they behave like this natural system. These are caterpillars that a single caterpillar moves at the rate of a single caterpillar. But then if you have multiple caterpillars, I hope it repeats, it should repeat. Okay, so let's be clear. Let's say there's coffee after this and we wanna get our coffee fastest. Now you know what to do. We have to climb each other's backs and rush out. But, but the caterpillar that's right above the bottom one goes twice the speed. And the one above that goes three times the speed, right? And when it gets to the end, it sacrifices itself to going slower. And, but it does keep up with the group, right? I mean, you can say caterpillars are smarter than particles, but these are not smart particles, right? So the, the, if you ever watch a stadium of people empty, we are not smart, okay? <laughs> that must be an engineered system that we don't jam and kill each other doing it, okay? Joking, not joking, so... Um, so these are the things that come to mind. My lab, funded by the Applied Physics Labs, makes lots of different materials. Some of we talk about, some we don't. But we make different shaped particles, and you can think of the library of different particles. Glotzer and Solomon has a really nice article on how can you break symmetry in particles. Um, the simplest one, arguably, is keep it a sphere, but just change the chemistry on the outside of that, right? So these are called Janus particles, if you're Greek, sorry, Janus particles. Um, and what's great about this, this is the uh, Roman god, or Greek god, Giannis. And uh, you can also think of January, the beginning and the end of the year. So it pops up, you know, the janitor goes in and out of your office. You can get more into detail about that if you want. But um, 
It was coined by uh, Pierre de Gen back in the 90s. And, and we didn't have an idea of how to make these, but people were thinking ahead, like, what if we had a solid particle amphiphilic molecule-like material that was hydrophobic or hydrophilic? And you can literally break symmetry in lots of different ways, make it fluorescent or unlabeled, reactive, unreactive, magnetic, non-magnetic, okay? You can do this, once you break the symmetry chemically, you can do a lot of things with this, which is great. Um, and so there's a lot of complications in making these. Uh, there's, you can use microfluidics. There's some limitations. I'm gonna take too much time on that. Uh, Pickering emulsions where you have an interface, but then there's a lots of limitations to the kind of chemistry. The easiest way by far is just to deposit a monolayer of these and then evaporate it like a metal. And of course it's proportional to the surface area and making a monolayer, usually you're talking about small samples, but um, the scale up is really limited by how easily you can scale up that process. But what's great is the things I would have talked about if I wasn't talking, if I was talking more to chemical engineers is this development of role to role coding processes where we think about how to organize particles into ordered arrays. This looks like it's being played backwards. It's not, it's coming from solution and then being drawn in here, the long range attraction through evaporation and the short range repulsion through electrostatics causes them to crystallize into a monolayer. Uh, and some capillary forces help here as well. Um, and then we have scaled that up. So we, this is my hand with a flashlight underneath. We can make rolls of this stuff. So that was the, so one batch of this is like five PhDs worth of the old way of making these wafer by wafer or slide by slide, right? So we, we just make piles of Janus particles now, which is great. And I never wanted to just study these for the heck of it. If I was in a physics department, maybe I would do more of that. But someone always says, gives me, they give me money and say, you have to do something you know, less creative and more practical with it. I'm bound with my engineering degree, I guess, to that degree. <laughs> but um, we do make time to do that. So uh, the scale up, by the way, just to give you an idea, these are lots of different literature on whether the number of particles or the mass of the particles versus the size of the particles and just just in our lab, we're orders of magnitude faster, making lots of particles. And we're not even talking about, it. we can easily make it as wide as this room. I've visited 3M. They do coding processes in airplane hangar like scale labs, right? So, um, and then you just evaporate metal on it. So all the particles I'm gonna talk about are iron oxide, well, iron evaporated onto particles, you expose it to air, it'll be iron oxide. And if it's thick enough, which we make nanometer thick shells, it is magnetic material. The beauty of this is number one, the dipole of these particles is offset from the center. And two, we can really think of still large particles with a little bit of magnetic interactions that also happen at the surface. So you can really tune this very delicately. You can do it with nickel and make it paramagnetic if you want. We've done that, it's fine, you know, whatever. It doesn't change much of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, there's, these are like the ugliest particles we've ever made, but fine, Part, material on other particles. And people have interest in swimmers, as I showed you before. Um, we've studied that as well. You put two different uh, conductivity uh, materials, and then you have an electric field, and you'll have electrokinetic flow driven at the surface, and they'll swim along. They can sit at an interface like an amphiphilic molecule, like an oil water, or you can get them, these have the same hexagonal structure, but the caps are ordered differently. And you get completely different types of metamaterials, for instance, that have different types of one type of structural symmetry, but different types of electromagnetic symmetry to them, right? And we can actually do different things to arrange particles that way. This is from the granite group that they made this uh, CAGME lattice, kind of like the back of a wicker chair, which is totally cool. So um, you can get them in magnetic fields to chain up. Uh, and then depending on the strength of the magnetic field and get them those chains to condense and so forth. We use those by making variable emissivity fluids I can talk about the application, but like Harry Potter, you change magnetic field and they change how much light passes through them just by first forming individual particles, forming chains and those chains being manipulated, which is great. Uh, think satellite technology and dumping heat into space. Okay, that might be a good application for this. Um, you can also make a tablet. We've actually made surfaces coated with capsules full of these particles that look like a, essentially a high-tech Etch-a-Sketch, okay? Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're kind of working in that space. But again, that's not, there's a little bit of complex systems in here, especially when you add a complex fluid that has a non-Newtonian rheology, but they mostly behave the way you show them, right? The other beauty of this is the individual particles get pumped in and then they assemble and then you can make, so the rheology of these isn't as complex as you would have to deal with. There's lots of magnetic fluids, like ferrofluids, magnetorheological fluids. But again, 
this is where you have most like a, a bulk uh, stresses on the system and that's interacting in these spikes through the surface energy. And then these materials essentially have a yield stress because you turn on the electric, uh, the magnetic field and essentially arrest the system, right? We're talking about something we can do a little more delicately than either of these systems, okay? And the scale can change. So what was the first thing we did with our micro rollers? Well, these are not micro rollers. This is a, a gel beads and then we index match them. So this is kind of, we do this in our lab, but I like Sujit Datta's uh, video of this on his website. Um, but there was something hidden in there. He looks at like transparent soils and how does, how does transport occur in a soil, right? Well, actually it's kind of complicated. If I put particles in there, they're just gonna sit on the top. So I have another experiment here where I just dumped my micro rollers and they're sitting at the top and this is the magnetic field is off, meaning it's not moving. And they're stuck here, but once I turn that on, there we go, they start rolling and then they can make their way through the matrix and increase the transport coefficient by orders of magnitude, right? So if you wanna remediate something from soil, you wanna deliver antibiotics to something that like to microbe that's creating biofilms that are, because sand is simple as sand is also, it's the first step of filtering every drop of drinking water you've ever had in your life, okay? So microbes, biofilms, Bad, right? So you can deliver things down into the soil. And in fact, you can use magnetic force to reverse the forces such that they roll and come back out, right? Uh, these are rotated from the top. So that is gravity driven flow. In fact, here's another video of this. My student just shakes it up, lets them all settle on top of the particles. What's great, you can kind of turn it on and off and control the rate at which they transport just through that. But again, these are kind of individual micro roller dynamics. The physics are not super interesting there, you know, little location theory and so forth. There they go, they spontaneously make, not spontaneously, they activated, they make their way through the soil. So what happens back to granular systems, okay? That's jam sparkles, that's a whole pile of jam sparkles moving there. Okay, so we have lots of them, we can put them in drums. We can do every, all the things people have done with granular systems. And the other thing is in the meantime, people have looked at how, what is the rheological profile of these things? So this is the inertial number, the shear rate times the particle diameter divided by the confining stress, mainly gravity. And then they're divided by their density. And this is a, a, a dimensionless number, essentially it tells you, you know, something about how to scale flows, whether they have more of a linear profile or an exponential surface-like bounded profile of flow. And so the modeling I used to do when I was a graduate student, we kept that relatively simple to the worrying about the kinematics of the flow. But now we're thinking about what are the stress profiles inside these systems as they flow? And you think about, I add a certain amount of energy and then th let things relax. They go from potential energy through heat dissipation, right? Through lots of frictional interactions. And why do they make boundary layers like this and so forth? It's how stress propagates into the system, right? So you go through a macroscopic bulk-like thing to macroscopic interactions that dissipate material, the interactions. And so if I look at a flowing layer, okay, it has some angle of repose that you can characterize. So that, I'm just giving you some examples. There's hundreds of articles that characterize the what is the friction coefficient compared to the flowing layer angle and so forth? And there, there's some very simple things that you can derive in an engineering standpoint, but then getting into the details, it gets more complicated, right? You also get into uh, boundary layer velocity profile. Uh, for instance, this is another example. Ivanka Carr was a student at Toulouse as well. And there are lots of great examples of measurements of this from the Lepto Lab and, and uh, other, other people who work in granular systems. But thinking about there are linear regimes of the shear rate and then you have kind of other things happening to the surface and then this exponential decay. Someone could argue, well, at infinity down, it's still moving, but engineering wise, probably not that useful to know, right? So here's the thought experiment. Instead of letting them just dissipate their interactions, I make them roll, right? And so I look microscopically, I have particles that will rotate through rotating a magnet underneath, right? Um, and then I can also think about what are the neighboring interactions? Will they just slide past each other and lubricate? Or will they sometimes chain up? And I can tune that by tuning the magnitude of the magnetic field, not just the rate of rotation, for instance. So I have two separate dials here where I essentially control friction more or less in the system and I control rotation rate. You don't get those knobs usually in experiments like this, right? Maybe you're, if you do simulations, by the way, I didn't show anyone before we had some results, who does simulations, I was afraid they just steal this because it's so easy to do on a computer. But they spontaneously start rolling uphill, 
And so the question is, is it a granular flow? That was my first I, postdoc, who was a chemistry postdoc, showed me a vial of these. He said, that's funny. And I said, this is the first time I've ever seen sand roll uphill, OK? Spontaneously heap uphill, right? So let me characterize this like a physics. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is a pile of them just sitting there, just sitting there. Not, not, yeah, there's no external forces besides gravity and the magnetic field making individual particles rotate and then once in a while, chain up against. Getting on that, right? So I'll, I'll come back to that. That's a good question, right? Geometry, boundary conditions geometry always matters to some degree, right? Confining stress here is gravity mainly. So it's a, is a, is a free surface flow. Right, so that is the main thing. The, the experiment maybe is ten times wider than this, and there has to be recirculation, right? So, in fact, if I start the experiment, they'll start rolling uphill. They kind of keep creeping up and go down, and that depends on the exact parameter. But this theta, this is the ne negative angle of repose, right? Without you know uh, these weird cohesive systems that can be made, right? Um. So here is also tan theta, and this is the magnetic strength beta zero is essentially a distance of the magnet that nothing will happen it's kind of boring right and then as i bring it closer it's enough to get some agitation in the system so it's the easiest way to scale stuff in the system there's i mean you can get into like the the mason number you know and, and other ways to and we kind of played with that these are inertial systems not viscous dominated systems right so it doesn't quite apply the same so anyway uh you can see that the highest Angle of repose is either really low or really high, and then we go through some optimization. And then these different data points are, again, uh, different fill amounts in the experiment, thinking about how much confining pressure there is to what depth, right? And so, and then the color of each one is the fraction of fluidization. So only some of the particles are moving here, and all the particles are essentially moving here. When I say all, I mean like the whole thing is turning. I'll show you some cool videos of that later. And so that there's this optimization point where I can say there's two different kinds of dynamics. Here and going this way, I can think of it as these are marching up a hill of relatively static things. And then they're going to get to an angle of repose and more or less stagnate. Okay. So it's it's to say there's a velocity profile, that there is a long-term stagnation that's going to happen in these systems where they just can't go uphill anymore. On the flip side, on the other, and then there is a little bit of recirculation down here, but then there's relatively static things happening here. Whereas on the other side, we definitely have uphill motion and convection throughout the entire cell, okay? Everything is fluidized in, in the system, okay? Um, but again, is it a granular flow? I mean, you don't expect these things necessarily behave like granular materials, right? So you can simply look at the kinematics of like, how are, what, what is the flow profile? So these are different fill levels. Uh, these are different magnetic fields. We did the experiment over and over a lot. We can look at the velocimetry in the system, right? And get an idea how it behaves. Reminder of how these things behave too, okay? Um, and so, okay, just zooming in on this one, for instance, this is in this direction, increasing the magnetic field strength, okay? Or more friction in the system. And it actually rotates faster. They can gain more traction to go. And then there's more recirculation in those systems also. But um, you, know, you do have, always have a little bit of negative value of velocity you know, here kind of recirculating in the system. Right? But if I think of those caterpillars and how they're moving, the second one is just moving twice the speed as the first one. It has a lot more to do with the local mechanics, and just to say they're rolling. They're rolling at some speed. So instead of thinking of some complicated inertial number, well, the shear rate matters, but the shear rate is really just proportional to the rotation rate. So if I just simply make it dimensionless this way and not any more complicated, and then plot, the, this is the distance and then this is the velocity profile, all my data collapses quite nicely. Granular system don't always collapse that nicely. My argument is this collapses that nicely because we're injecting energy at the microscale and it's dissipating energy at the microscale, okay? We're not looking at like what happens far away to dissipate energy here. It's always here, okay? All the dynamics, our energy is injected and dissipated within a few particle diameters of where that's happening. And in fact, I can also look at the, this, that shear rate compared to the magnitude of the, um, the magnetic force. And that collapses very nicely here too. So essentially, if I think about this, I, I can now completely 
you know, the amount of friction is the square of the, the field, and then the field is actually the square of the height distance. So it is pretty sensitive to how far that magnet is. So engineering these things is a little complicated. And the actual depth profile, the surface is feeling a little bit different magnetic force than somewhere inside. Okay? So you can put these in Helmholtz coils and do everything. We're doing all of that too. So um, the data collapse, I think, is really because the driving force anticipation is really happening at the local scale. And all this stuff about complex systems and network theory and so forth, the stresses still propagate some link scales that are hard to identify, right? But at the same time, uh, something about the local dynamics now compared to the global dynamics are kind of recovered in these systems, right? So I can do a couple other parlor tricks for you, okay? I settle a granular media down and I wait a certain amount of time. When I tip it on its edge, it'll take some time before it starts flowing again. And if I wait twice as long, the density will be that much higher and it'll take that much longer to reflow. In fact, Oliver Polake has this great example where he tap, magically taps the thing and then it won't flow anymore, right? So in our systems, I've done that, settled it and I've tilted to the side and then magnetic field off. It's not settling very fast, but magnetic field on. It releases all the stresses. And what's great is I picked an angle at which this is tilted that they're just gonna roll right out of the container because that's lower than the angle of repose for these materials, <laughs> which is cool. We can get them to, they, you will see eventually that it gets up to the meniscus and gets trapped by the capillary force. And these are in a liquid. We can do them dry as well. People often ask that. Is it quite as nice dry? No. Is it easier to visualize when it's wet? Yes. So, um, and then we have a creative undergrad who's made staircases and looked at collective dynamics of how these things can climb stairs. It's like the Terminator movie or something, right? You know, turns out when you have not a, a single micro roller is 1 20th the height of a stair. Forget it, never making it over. But collectively, they can work together to work up the stairs. And you can see now, these, this is a high magnetic field. They're chaining up pretty large. This is a different pitch than this one. These are two entirely different experiments. And they're kind of making it over, but it's harder, right? So you have to have a critical amount of material. You have to have a, a critical amount of frictional interactions. You have a critical amount, well, the rotation rate pretty much scales out, right? That's actually the most boring part of this. So um, she's graduating. I tried to get her to go to grad school, but she's gonna make a lot of money instead. That was for the grad students. I know it's painful. So um, and one last thing, I think we're almost out of time. The yeah, caterpillars just remind you of that. Um, I put in unresponsive particles, which are white. They're the same particles without the magnetic caps. I let them settle. These are, are a little heavier, so they settle faster. But I just put them in the solution, shake it up, let it settle. Magnetic caps, kind of, these are the micro rollers, and they're just sitting there. What's going to happen? I told you granular materials love to segregate. Well, kind of segregated right off the bat. There's no size difference, essentially, but there's a density difference. And I start rotating. I get the angle repose still, and then the granular material, it starts going right up and then convecting everything else. Right. Even cooler than that, if you look really careful at the interface here, it's not super unlike the Helmholtz waves that you saw in density differences there, right? So there's all kinds of cool dynamics. In fact, we have like the titles of the next 15 papers we're gonna write with this stuff. <laughs> it's a matter of having enough hands to do the work. I mean, we've already made good headway in doing lots of experiments with different uh, distance of the magnet um, and then different rotation rates. And the one I was showing you, I think is my favorite one is this one here, but you can see these are repeating. And I think these are, I can't remember if they're scaled. Uh, yeah, this is per rotation, I think. So in any case, you can see that it gets really inertial and stirs things up. Whereas these are almost like a quasi static deformation and segregation kind of thing. So I know I'm practically over time. I think the next slide I have is just thanking my group one more time. I, I hate conclusion slides because I don't know what to conclude with. I showed you a lot of different stuff. So your, the conclusions are best identified with your questions. And thank you very much for your invitation. Okay, anyone with questions? I can just... Someone else says I can. So with the uh, with the advent of 3D printing with um, say metals, does you and you mentioned this coating problem that exists for you know paints or even simpler materials? What uh, insights does this um, looking at say the microrheology of particles provide when you're trying to do this with 
more sophisticated materials that are harder to. Yeah, I mean, so I'll, I'll say we're in a mode every week we come up with a bunch of ideas and I'd say one of them is a good idea. Okay, I have, I have a group of five undergraduates who are going to work with me this summer. One's an architecture major. We're going to let them play in the sandbox, literally, <laughs> right? We have an undergrad who said, we, we're looking at drying of paints on one side. What if we had some of these to in, intentionally drive convection to stop skin formation during the drying process with some cheap, small volume fraction materials that would help intentionally agitate the system while it's drying? I mentioned that to my collaborators at, at uh, PPG. They're like all over it, ready to write another check. So, I mean, sky's the limit right now, okay? Um, you can think of these particles being robots. You can think of how do I change stress in the system? How can I do very fundamental experiments where I can extract things more accurately than you could before? There's a huge range across the landscape of things you can do with this. We're all over the place right now. I mean, if someone's going to tell me after this, you must do this, I will do it. Someone else says, you must send me particles so I can do this. I will probably send you particles. I, what's great is I just send it by the foot. You know, I literally roll them up. They don't have to send the liquid. Um, so there are lots of applications. So, that, I mean, these particles themselves also, when they rotate, you might see a little bit in some of the videos. I mean, it's flashing color and so forth. So, I mean, there are chromatic responses at a very high level. That's what we were paid to do with making paints that have capsules of these materials that you put on something that someone cares about. Right. And that's great, you know, but I, I think it's kind of wasted on that, to be honest. And there are lots of engineering challenges with doing that. And we succeed in most of them. They, you know, we'll, still, we'll see if re renewal of funding happens. Right. But I mean, I'm much more interested in kind of these fundamental questions of like, how can we use this to probe locally stress response? When does geometry matter more than those things still? We, we didn't have answers to those in granular systems. Particularly well. When do the boundary conditions matter? That was your question at the beginning of that. And they, they still matter. We, we put them in drums rotating and then rotated them slowly to rotate the opposite way. And yeah, sure, you can make it level and flat. I'm not sure how interesting that is, but you can do it. It's fine, you know? So, and again, what are the macroscopic stresses? The review of the paper right now, where we have going through, um, one of the biggest comments is like define friction better. There are different regimes, it's complicated, right? Hopefully they'll publish it still. Oh, uh, unless you deem it not important enough, right? That's it. <laughs> I'm I'm struck by uh, how important for like much of what you show today, the scale up of the synthesis of the particles is really the crux, right? And being able to have a bucket of material makes the types of experiments you're doing possible. Um, <laughs> you can't make quite make a truckload of material, but a bucket, maybe. Um, Little so, Tonka trucks. So this is, it strikes me that like, this has been a challenge in kind of nanoparticle synthesis for a very long time. And your solution is quite elegant. I, I'm just kind of curious about what you've thought about of like commercialization and stuff like that. And when, what, like, how does this compare to like certain costs, uh, cost of like other types of synthesis strategies? My, my patent lawyer told you to ask that question, right? That's the, the, the reality is, is the, the scale up is de disconnected from the application is incredibly hard to protect. There are patents of, around Langmuir Blodgett troughs and so forth, right? And those are mostly expired anyway, but like there's, there's, there's lots of patents around different things and we're just taking a different combination of things that kind of exist, right? You know, so fine. And we're not commercializing it yet, so we don't have to worry about their patents. We're doing it academically. But um, the patents will lie deeply with the applications you use these materials for. And that's gonna be the easiest thing. So I do have a couple, you know, I, I, now before I give a talk somewhere, I talk to my patent lawyers, that's true. Um, but we, you know, the patent lawyers, at the people at, the, at, at Lehigh who do this. But the, the, the simple answer is, um, you know, we're, we're in a mode where, again, these crazy applications in fields I don't even think about, and someone sees this and they say, you can use it for something totally different, and we can just send the materials now. Steve Granick himself even said, he had the wax templating thing, all his beautiful nature papers and so forth, they never use the particles they synthesize using that wax, wax templating thing. You get too much polydispersity in the system, right? 
And so, yeah, we go back to doing the same simple thing. And my friend Alona Kreshmar, who makes the materials at City College to look at magnetic materials, we figured out literally five students, five years during their PhD combined, one batch of ours is order of magnitude larger than the amount of particles they've ever made, right? You know, so it does make a difference. More is better <laughs> and more is different. This is the complex systems group. We know that. But I never wanted to study Janus particles for the heck of just studying, studying Janus particles. I wasn't motivated by that. It was the G whiz thing that happened. We were making them anyway for some really specific application that someone was write, willing to write a check for. So as I was looking at the particles and also at the example of the caterpillars, I was actually thinking of about the alpha surfaces in which it's like you have rollers that you can see inside the thing. I don't know if that is something that you have not done yet or have not thought of, but I think that would be the interesting thing. If you if you enclose a bunch of these particles inside a membrane, right? And now uh, to what extent is this feasible? Because you can kind of control the mass. So I, I don't know where it is in my extra slides, but a cover of Science Robotics had these little um, hex bugs. Have you ever seen them? They, they jump and they move anisotropically because of their motion. And they took a dozen of these and they put it in an elastic membrane. And what happens is they randomly go, but then when they work with the interface, they start aggregating. They, their, dire their direction is combined, right? And then they can make it through an orifice, make it through a puzzle, that kind of thing. And that was on the cover. So we were thinking we can do the same thing. And then you, we can do the same thing. In fact, one of our first grant applications was on this. Getting it to work, when you get to smaller scales, so surface energy is the dominant force when you get down to these scales. So you just put it in a droplet. Okay. Some things work, but it's, comp it's never quite as nice as you would imagine. But making little tank treading droplets that have these things kind of pushing it along on a surface. We've seen evidence of it, but it's, there's too much attraction of that to the interface, right? We've done it with giant liposome systems. Again, it's so messy. I mean, if I'm interested in publishing a paper where I just show one liposome full of a couple of particles and then, you know, just studying, but it, it's not how I do science, I guess is the way I would say it. Someone else can do that, think, you know, but that's, that's um, things that are repeatable, things that I can, you know, uh, characterize a little more generously than I found the one that works, right? So that's why we're, but your, your idea came to us about a year ago. Finished perfectly on time. Thank you. See you next week.